Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome once again for another session of this eighth ECD Day, English Culture and Diversity Day. Uh, now we are here for the afternoon sessions with three guests who will talk a little bit about uh, the topic of the, the event, which is related to Miss and this information. And for this afternoon, I have the pleasure to receive three specialists in literature and three names, three professors, uh, three dear friends who will talk a little bit about this uh, such instigating topic. So we're going to have the presence of Professor Dr. Yuri Givago Amorim Caribe from Universidade Federal de Pernambuco. Uh, we also have the presence of Professor Dr. André Carvalho from Universidade Federal do Paraná. And we have the presence of Professor Dr. Fernando Poiana, my friend, my guitar player, my bluesician, my bluesman <laughs> from São José do Rio Preto. <clears throat> so I Thank you a lot. I thank you for accepting the invitation. I thank you for uh, accepting the, 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 the challenge to talk to us. And uh, we, of course, on the other hand, have the pleasure to hear you. Um, and all together with such a, such a nice topic. And without further delays, Uh, we are going to start our roundtable session with Professor Dr. Yuri Givago, Amorim Caribe. Uh, Professor Yuri is a lecturer of English and American literature at the Federal University of Pernambuco <clears throat> since 2015. He holds a PhD in English language and literary studies with emphasis on translation studies from University of Sao Paulo. Having studied the novel The Hours by Michael Cunningham, um, published in 1998, he published articles in national and international journals on the following topics, literary and film adaptation, literary translation, literatures in English, queer literature and orality studies, his main areas of interest. So Professor Yuri, Thanks again for accepting the invitation, and the stage is yours, okay? Thank you, Ivan. Thank you for the invitation. It's going to be a conversation, okay, my dear colleagues, uh, not properly a speech or a lecture, but a conversation on fake news related to literature, that which is my field of studies. Uh, and it was, for me, an opportunity to visit, to revisit my master's dissertation, which I have written during the years 2005 and 2006, a long time ago. Uh, and during those years, uh, fake news were not fake news, the fake news we know, we know nowadays. But I, start, I, uh, I arrived at the book university, I took my master's here in Brazil, thinking about uh, something I have started studying during my undergraduate course. And then I came to study uh, keywords like humor, gossip, and the expression is uh, word to mouth. Uh, even I'm not seeing the, the slide. Ah, okay. <laughs> word to mouth which is an expression, the correct expression we use in English. In Portuguese, we say boca, 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 comunicação boca, boca, many kinds. I was determined to research about, in this case, but I had to study many things that came, you know, before those, uh, before the, the world to mouth propaganda. And I was very interested uh, in studying humor and gossip. But 
for example, uh, only to uh, news that use it to appear in uh, magazines, newspapers. Yes, it was the first proper decade of uh, internet. You know, we had the end of the 90s, but we had the first decade of the year 2000 uh, in which we started having uh, the popularization of internet all over the world. So when I ended my dissertation, I had a good study uh, related to fake news, but not with that name. And uh, we had something that came before uh, the, the, the spreading and the popularization of internet. So it was not very common, for example, to use verbs like viralizing, you know, that news came to viralize. Um, we did not have WhatsApp, for example. <laughs> and uh, we had fake news, of course, during all those years. But things were very different, as I'm going to show you. OK, so the name of my speech is Literature and Fake News. Perspectives on Contemporary Literatures in English. Let me turn on here. Uh, so, a summary. Unfortunately, fake news are part of modern societies. I say unfortunately because, you know, many bad things and terrible things happen because of the spreading of fake news. As a very relevant and current theme, thus... Books about fake news are becoming more and more popular within contemporary literatures in English. I mean, um, previous authors, previous writers have already written about fake news, um, exploring the theme or creating stories, creating uh, fake news to write the stories or using fake news that really happened to inspire them to write the novels, you know. Or we have the case of non-fictional books, non-fiction books, uh, people that really research it and have written essays and very important books about the theme during the whole uh, 20th century. Uh, but we're talking especially about uh, the spreading of fake news uh, is inspiring more and more writers, contemporary authors, writers, to write about them, about fake news. So we have um, a considerable increase in the number of books, fiction and non-fiction books, which fake news are a very important topic. So through this lecture, I want to discuss fake news as a process of communication, which is the expression I use it. I use it uh, during my research within my masters, having the humor and the gossip as ancestors. Then I am going to show some recent books about fake news that have been recommended by literary critics, not necessarily by me, okay, but by very important literary critics. So first, it's important to talk about modern societies and fake news. We have um, many uh, facts, many things that happened related to fake news, and they affect they affect directly our lives in terms of elections, in terms of um, making someone becoming very famous, or destroying the career of a person, or changing the roots the destinies of people, cities, neighborhoods, uh, businesses, um, enterprises, companies, nations, the whole world. So uh, the modern societies, the modern world is dealing, is learning how to deal with fake news. Um, it's very hard to um, trying to end what fake news uh, are doing and it's even more difficult to make people stop spreading fake news there is there are some very important studies 
saying that sometimes the lies spread by fake news, né? é, they interest people uh, much more than the truth. That's why uh, we have uh, fake news uh, as something very that which is very common nowadays and which is part of our lives. Uh, possible consequences of fake news. I have already mentioned some of them, but during my the process of writing my dissertation, I researched the destruction of a school, something that happened uh, during the 90s in a school in Sao Paulo, the destroying careers of actors, TV presenters, famous people. So uh, we don't know who created uh, that thing, that fake news, uh, but the consequences are always very bad and terrible for the person, for a company, like I said. Uh, the objective, to swing public opinion towards some way, so most of the times, most of the times, but not always, uh, somebody or some in some situation is trying to direct the opinion of people in a determined way. So, I mean, there is an objective when someone uh, spreads uh, fake news, you know? It's not by chance. It's not something occasional. Uh, most of the times, there is an interest involved, an objective uh, to be reached. Invisible forces, not always invisible, as you know, uh, trying to manipulate people's minds. And studies show that they really reach this objective and this, this target. Um, it's not so difficult to manipulate people's minds with repetition, you know, with many strategies. And it's not a matter of, uh, you know, um, I don't know, not only a matter of education, but some fake news are really, um, how can I say, difficult not to be involved with them, you know. So manipulating people's minds are always, are something that happens every day. Um, for example, when we have the propaganda, the advertisement of a product, you do not need, but you buy it the same way. It means, I mean, it worked out, you know, uh, uh, the person uh, wanted to sell and the person found someone who bought the product. So uh, this is a very uh, simple kind of manipulation. But some fake news, they seem uh, not fake, you know, and people believe in those news. And there are techniques, uh, techniques to spread fake news, to create fake news. And those techniques are used by both uh, people, you know, those ones who create the news, the fake news, and those ones who spread the fake news. Um, and this is a process which is very difficult to retain, you know, to stop. When fake news start being spread, it's difficult to stop them. Um, main techniques used to spread fake news. Subverting opinion polls. <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing because th this is happening right now. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Um, repeatedly feeding lies, exaggerations, and humors to the news, to the news cycle using nowadays. Now I had to update my dissertation uh, using social networks and messaging apps. During those years, I think we only had Orkut. I don't know if everyone remembers, but nowadays we have especially Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and other social networks. And messaging apps like those ones, the most famous ones we have, uh, for example, here in Brazil. 
So uh, repeating, uh, feeding lies, you know, the exaggerations and humors, repeating them, spreading them, usually uh, using social networks and messaging apps. Repetition is also very important. Humor, gossip, and word of mouth. Those are the terms I have researched during my dissertation, and I, I uh, call them, I call them processes of communication, because my dissertation was uh, within the communication studies, and within the orality studies, you know, humor, gossip, something very old, that's why I'm called them ancestrals uh, of uh, fake news, you know, and the resource, the main resource was first the orality, of course, then we had written things, then we had newspapers, um, and related to that, we have the word of mouth. Word of mouth is an expression that means many things. For example, uh, we have the, the recommendation of products, which is a very Kind of a very strong kind of propaganda. I mean, it's easier uh, it's uh, easier to buy a product that a friend of yours, you know, or a, a relative uh, recommends, and then uh, if you watch a propaganda, a TV ad, you know, on TV, of course. Uh, so word of mouth is something very important. The term in Portuguese is propaganda boca a boca or marketing boca a boca in english we say word of mouth and um, this is also a way you know a path for fake news but uh, we may not forget the importance of apps you know texting apps messaging apps for spreading fake news um, of the press you know um, of the newspapers, um, websites that are used, are that websites that promote, that uh, how can I say, publish news without checking the truth, you know, and things like that. So the speed of the information nowadays is something very peculiar, you know. Um, so uh, when you spread something, you must check it out before many times before spreading this was uh, uh, this is supposed to be the best way uh, for a person not uh, trying not to spread uh, something which i don't know if it's true or not you know uh, this sentence is very common nowadays the news has been realized have been realized i mean the those news you know um everybody's knowing everybody heard of it everybody has read in some place um, and this is very difficult to control so i researched the relationship the inter relationship between humor gossip and word of mouth related uh, to um, how can i say some a group groups of people in the city of Sao Paulo, and as a strategy of communication, uh, a very old, very old strategies of communication. In this case, we have fake news as a very peculiar uh, processes process of communication. You know, because we have many people involved. Sometimes we have money involved. Many times we have power involved. You know and the destiny of people, sometimes thousands, billions of people. Uh, so fake news are the most recent term, you know, uh, and the more the most used one nowadays related to um, that has as ancestors, humor, gossip, and word of mouth. Next one. So uh, I arrived in the point that I really wanted uh, to emphasize during my talk, 
which is the presence of this theme, you know, this uh, very nice theme uh, within the literary studies, you know. I mean, I'm talking about fake news now as a motivation, you know, an inspiration for writers, writers, researchers, because I'm talking about fiction and nonfiction books. When I talk about fiction, I'm talking about novels, novels created uh, by writers that are that have been inspired, that were, that had the inspiration, maybe based on fake news. That really, that really, uh, not really happened, of course, because they're fake. But fake news, which were spread in some moment in history, or situations, fake situations, they have created for their own stories, you know? So uh, now I'm talking about the presence of fake news, you know, uh, the theme, fake news, within literature, you know, within the literary studies, and I'm talking about fiction and non-fiction books. Uh, it's very important to say that during the whole 20th century, we had writers uh, creating stories and non-fiction books uh, involving fake news. And I'm going to show you the cover of some of those uh, books, most famous ones, the recommendation was done by the author named... I forgot his name. Uh, Henry Hemming. He's a writer also, and he has recommended some very important books related to fake news. And I divided them into parts. The oldest ones, now the previous ones published during the 20th century, uh, and what I call the contemporary ones. Now, um, from the years 2001 on, which I consider it contemporary. Né? So I'm going to show you the cover, for example, the book named Propaganda by Edward Bernat, published in 1928, um, which is a book that tries to explore a more Freudian approach to fake news and the power of focusing less on what we say uh, we want and more on our hidden fears and desires. This in 1928. And before you ask me, I have not read all of them, but at least two I have read, okay? Then we had, for example, in 1938, the book Propaganda in the Next War by Sidney Rogerson. Um, uh, those one, uh, it's a book about um, many situations involving fake news related to wars, you know, and uh, he has written that one of them uh, and those situations involving propaganda, uh, um, it's a kind of non-fiction book, you know, with uh, some stories that really happened in previous years, you know. Then we had the famous 1984 by George Orwell, of course, which is a very uh, famous novel an adapted novel for the cinema, for many situations. Recently, it has been adapted for a play, and after the, the recent elections, American elections, uh, 1984, George Orwell has been um, debated a lot. So it's a kind of eternal book, eternal novel, you know, and very important and very, and of course, contemporary, you know, because the situation is, is repeated many times, you know. And finally, we have this book with that huge name, British Security Coordination, The Secret History of British Intelligence in Americas, in the Americas, from 1940 to 45, by William Stephenson, Ronald Dahl, Gilbert Hallett and Tom Hill, published in 98. 
Um, so those books, uh, th that writer has said, never intended to be published. This is a flawed but fascinating book. It is a sanctioned insider's account of the British influence campaign in the US and was only meant to be read by a handful of civil servants with the right security clearance. It is full of revelations and at the same time literate with mistakes and exaggerations. A book about disinformation that is riddled with, well, disinformation. It's very uh, recommended, this book. So those ones are the, the ones I consider it as contemporary, you know, post-2001. Uh, the number is bigger, you know, we have more books related to fake news. I think some of the writers you know, of course, but some of them are not so popular here in Brazil, but they are famous in other parts of the world, in other parts of the world. And those books are very well recommended by uh, at least one of those three, uh, how can I say, um, instances involved in the possible canonization of a book, the Academy, Literary Critics, uh, or how can I say, the Academy, Literary Critics, or the readers themselves, because sometimes or many times a book is read, it's very, uh, people buy it and read it a lot, and it becomes, for example, a bestseller. Uh, sometimes a book is very well recommended by the Academy and the critics, but people do not read it. Uh, so that's why we have those three very important instances to recommend a book, you know. Uh, and those ones are very well recommended as contemporary uh, books on fake news, and all of them were uh, initially, you know, originally written in English. So I'm talking about English-speaking countries, you know, I'm talking about English-speaking writers, you know, those stories were, f were first written in English. That's what I'm calling literatures in English, okay? So the covers of those books, The Plot Against America, I think it's fam the most famous one, published in 2004 because it has been adapted for a TV series, you know, uh, and Philip Roth uh, is a very recognized uh, writer, as you know. Um, the one you very, one of the most famous ones, Henry Hammond, I always forget the name of, of him. Um, makes many compliments to this book of Philip Roth, and he says, this novel is the outlier on, on the list, in that it's not obviously about fake news. Most people will tell you it's an intensely personal and often autobiographical account of Roth's childhood and the lived experience of anti-Semitism. At the same time, it is an alternative history of America in which a racist, uh, in which a racist media personality Charles Lindbergh in 1940 becomes U.S. president, and the country becomes steadily more divided and xenophobic. So it's a very interesting story told by Philip Roth. Then we have Restless by William Boyd, published in 2006. Uh, what else, what else, what else? Um, much about a spy thriller as a novel about spies that is thrilling, thrilling, as well as taught, emotionally rich, brilliantly researched, and ultimately a powerful examination of the burden of spionage. It has been adapted to the movies. Then we have Voodoo Histories by David Aronovich, published in 2009. 
Um, as we learn more about its manipulation, we become more skeptical of the news. Abramovitz's analysis of conspiracy theories is provocative, compelling, and thoughtful. He is particularly good about conveying our unaligned need to latch onto a narrative. Then we have Broadcast History, uh, Hysteria by A. Brad Schwartz, another very famous one and also adapted to the movies. What else has he written about it? Then we have, um, sorry, just a moment, because I'm using two computers. A captivating look at the best known hoax of the 20th century, Orson Welles' 1938 radio dramatization of the War of the Worlds. Schwartz skewers the myths of Schwartz skewers the myths surrounding these broadcasts. It turns out there was little panic about an alien invasion, a very uh, used themes related to fake news. Then we have Weaponized Lies by Daniel Levitin. I don't know if it's the right pronunciation of his name. Um, but it's written that although every other book on this list focuses on the use and impact of fake news, all of them, in at least one instance, this one is a call to resistance. Most of them treat fake news as something very hard uh, to stop. It is a primer by a respected, a respected cognitive psychologist on how to spot lies and exaggerations in the media. Although parts of the book have the nanning tone of a self-help book, it is packed with fascinating material on the mis misuse of statistics and language. Language is also very important because we're talking about communication. So fake news must be easy, something easy to read, to spread, you know, to hear. Language is also very important. Then we have Cyber War by Kathleen Hall Jameson. What else he has written about it? He said... Um, Although we can never measure with precision the impact of the Russian influence campaign on the 2016 U.S. presidential election, this detailed study by renowned political communication academic Jameson is easily the best analysis we have. So it's a non-fictional book, also very important within this list. Our Man in New York, the British plot to bring America into the Second World War by Henry Hammack, the person who has written the whole post at The Guardian. It's there in my references, my sources, which helped me a lot to create this lecture. Uh, he also makes a kind of propaganda of his own book named Our Man in New York. And he is also a critic, a literary critic, who has suggested this very important list of books uh, on the theme of fake news. Books published during the 20th century, all of them, and books published from 2001 on, which I consider contemporary books, you know, written in English within uh, books of literatures in English uh, related to that theme. Those are my sources. I have used it not my whole time, but I'm going to stop by here. It's my master's dissertation and the, the report by Henry Hemming, Top 10 Books About Fake News. And thank you very much again for the invitation. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Professor Yuri, for your for very interest, interesting talk. We're going to discuss a little bit more about it at the end of, of the talks. So for sure, 
there will be a lot of uh, debate surrounding this um, this idea of fake news, right? Which has nothing uh, about being new. <laughs> it's very, you know, it's as old as um, the time when human beings started to speak. Um, but we, we'll go back to to that topic again. And I'd like now to uh, call Professor André Carvalho for for his talk. Uh, Professor André Carvalho has received a bachelor's degree a bachelor's degree in Letras, Language and Literature, Portuguese and English, from Universidade de São Paulo, USP, in 2008. Uh, he also holds a master's degree in English, Language and Literature at USP from 2013, and a PhD in Literary Theory at Universidade Estadual Paulista. He has concluded his postdoctoral fellowship at the Postgraduate Program of English at the University of Santa Catarina in 2022, and is currently a substitute professor at Universidade Federal do Paraná. His main fields expertise are cultural studies, American literature, and media studies. His doctoral dissertation won an honorable mention in the CAPES Awards for Dissertations 2019 in the literature category. So Professor André is now uh, going to deliver his talk titled The Machine Stops and the Disattention Economy. Professor André, if you please. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation, uh, Professor Ivan and also Professor Marcelo, who actually appointed me to you. So I'm, I'm very glad for the connection and yes. also for meeting everyone here. Uh, we do have a lot in common and I appreciate the background in communications that Yuri provided us. Uh, my dissertation uh, was about literature, uh, but it's not. it was in the category of literature, but it, what is actually about television. So I'm uh, in between fields. I, I can't really define exactly where I stand. And I think my uh, lecture will reflect that. Um, well, um, let me see just how I change. Okay. Well, uh, I'm going to be talking about The Machine Stops, which is a short story by Ian e. Forster, but this is really just a pretext to discuss attention economy and disattention economy and the commodity, the audience commodity theory. So I'm really hoping to provide a few concepts from communication theory uh, instead of actual analysis of literature. I have written about the machine stops in uh, academic papers and get, uh, have given lectures on this and we have great material on this short story by other authors here in Brazil as well. Uh, and so I would recommend you, if you're interested in the short story, reading about it there. My intention here as the topic of the event was about misinformation. So I, I think I will try to deal more with the actual uh, concepts from communications and media theory than with the literary analysis. So it will be just a pretext for us to delve into communication theory. Um, well, I will go through the main elements of the short story and some hypotheses that we can come up by you know, assessing the content of the story. This will be a very content-focused analysis, not a very formal analysis. Then I will go into the audience commodity theory, and I named it versions one and two because there is a classical audience commodity theory version. Uh, and then there are new developments in this area, which I find very interesting, interesting, and still they are not very well known. And they provide us with tools, with essential tools for you know, new ways, new avenues of analysis and hypothesis. So in the end, I will try to highlight some of the implications for research that these models will go through. Uh, I think I'll, I'll need to take this 30 minutes to do this. Uh, so let's go ahead. Well, The Machine Stops is this, this short story 
written in 1909, published in 1909. And there is an adaptation for TV, for the BBC adapted it for TV in 1966. So the few screenshots that I'll provide here, they are from this TV adaptation. It's available on YouTube and I highly recommend it. It's interesting, not as good as this short story, but it's interesting as well. Uh, this was a short story that in, during the first months of the pandemics, when people were in lockdown, especially in England, and I remember reading an editorial by a Guardian author uh, from the newspaper, The Guardian, and he was saying, hey, I reread the story recently, now that I'm in lock lockdown, and I'm, I'm amazed at the power of the foresight of EM Forsters to actually describe our current situation. So it is a short story that it could be used for teaching. I would highly recommend teachers and English teachers especially. You know, if you want to teach that story and to discuss the story, it certainly will resonate with the students nowadays and especially in times of pandemics. Everyone who lived through the pandemic and who started, you know, teleworking, they will uh, find echoes of that story in their lives. So, you know, some of the features of the plot, I mean, it deals with physical isolation. It is, it's a dystopian short story in an unknown future where people are pretty much living isolated lives. Everyone is inside their pod, uh, working and living and never going out uh, unless it's absolutely required. So they are very isolated physically, but they are uh, completely integrated in a communicative way. I mean, they, they have the internet, basically. They talk over the internet or something similar to the internet and they exchange information. So, I mean, again, there are, you can make parallels with Zoom, Zoom and social networks and any kind of remote work. Uh, they uh, spend their time sharing original content and original research. They give small lectures, you know, five or ten minute lectures, pretty much the way we're doing here, about specific topics. So this is this might be a critique of academia, of, you know, over specialization, but this also reminds us of, you know, uh, Great Courses Plus or Coursera or YouTube or all those platforms that allow you to share content. Uh, original content. Uh, they um, highlight this priority for images and oral content. Uh, it's pretty much uh, an oral communications. So, you know, again, we think of Instagram, we think of podcasts, we think of YouTube, and there is lesser degree of literacy and a higher degree of reality. Uh, the time is fragmented and the content is very superficial. I mean, people give five minute lectures on anything and they have to provide feedback and they have to provide original ideas. And this exchange, this rapid uh, exchange of information, it's so fragmented and so confusing for them that, well, again, uh, reflects or uh, reminds us of what we are living through right now. Uh, they are living in a world where the machine provides everything to them. The machine brings everything they need uh, to them. So if they need toilet paper, you know, the machine anticipates that need and delivers toilet paper to the people, to the person's door. Uh, that's pretty much uh, how we are moving towards, you know, where we are moving towards to. Uh, with Amazon and with the Internet of Things, we're living under constant surveillance and uh, logistics. There is a, a revolution in logistics powered by Amazon that is profiting greatly from that and that's changing the way we shop and the way we provide for uh, our needs. Uh, well, it's a world very centralized. There is only one machine. There is pretty much one company and the information is censored and it's pre-censored. I mean, people can find what they actually want. They can only uh, be led towards certain kinds of information and information that is vetted beforehand. So again, pretty uh, <laughs> common uh, nowadays. And I mean, the, the great conflict of the story are the impacts that this situation um, causes on the individuals, on the heroes, especially the hero, the protagonist of the novel. So we can clearly see that they suffer uh, impacts on their body, on their cognition, on subjectivity and politics. Everything uh, that you know, we are moving towards, we seem to be moving towards, it's something that uh, Forster clearly foresaw. Uh, so, I mean, 
how come Forster could do this? We need to formulate a hypothesis uh, about, you know, how could he see so far into the future? And, you know, we could formulate uh, uh, the uh, first hypothesis, you know, he predicted the future. He has magical powers and he could predict the future. And of course, you can refute this immediately because we do not believe in magic or in this power of prediction. So we need to come up with a second hypothesis. You know, Forster identified some trends which then became dominant and still prevail. So now because he foresaw those trends and they have prevailed, we retrospectively or retroactively acknowledge his foresight. I think this is a much uh, more reasonable assumption. Uh, a hypothesis. It, can, it needs an assumption. You know, he was in a position that allowed him to identify these tendencies. And we need to qualify this assumption. These tendencies may be identified by a certain class more than for others. I, and this is, uh, you know, content for future research, what kinds of fears and positions the intellectual and intellectual workers were going through that technical revolutions were, uh, were you know, frightening them. And I, I think this is especially interesting on intellectuals and writers and, you know, academics. And so Jack London and Forster and several other authors, you know, socialist authors were uh, pretty much afraid of the media revolutions that they were witnessing. And that's uh, pretty interesting for us and for us studies, stu uh, researchers on literature. Uh, well, there is an implication with this hypothesis. There were other trends, other worlds could be possible and things were happening in different directions. So again, this is a good implication for research. We could look into utopias and dystopias from this late and uh, 19th century and early 20th centuries. I love this period. I think everything we are right now uh, discussing media and fake news, this was set uh, in, in the modern way there at around those, uh, those 50, 40 years. And uh, well, that's pretty much all the, the necessary implication for now. Again, the great thing about the machine stops, in my opinion, is that it really delves into the, these interesting trends that now we recognize as dominant. For instance, uh, it dramatizes this internalization of consensus. I mean, we are moved much more by consensus and by an internalized consensus than by authoritarian coercion. You know, and this is what basically Gramsci describes as hegemony, this constant process of acquiring consent. So in my opinion, I mean, it's better than 1984 uh, for our circumstances and other dystopias that really rely on some authoritarianism uh, dystopia that a clear and, you know, heavy authoritarian dis uh, dystopia. So it unveils a much more subtle form of control. This internalized control is, for me, it's much more interesting and convenient uh, to, to be used to explain as a tool to explain what we're living through nowadays. However, I do think it has a disadvantage. It is blaming the system much more than uh, you know, actually pointing out certain agents. I was looking at Yudi's presentation right now and I was thinking, well, there's a great, uh, you know, tension between blaming systems and blaming agents. And the good thing about the fake news uh, study is that you can actually pinpoint agents. You can say, hey, Russia had a vested interest in overturning the elections, or Donald Trump had this interest, or Bolsonaro had this interest. So you immediately clear, you, you clearly see the agents of, uh, you know, that are promoting fake news and disinformation. However, I do think that there is something important about highlighting uh, these structures. You know, in the machine stops, there are no clear beneficiaries of this world. There's not an elite ruling. It's simply a, a system ruled by itself. So um, let's see how that works. Uh, it also foresees this tendency of leisure becoming work, of our mixing leisure and work. Uh, 
Uh, I mean, if you look at the time machine, you still have some kind of class division of division of labor. Uh, the ones below are doing all the work and are providing their bodies for the ones uh, on the upstairs, you know, the ones, the, the elites uh, just living with leisure. Again, this highlights an exploitation or an exploration that is done not by actual agents, but by a whole system. And I will, again, we'll uh, see what that, what that means later on. And another good uh, thing about this short story is that it highlights cognitive and political impacts. And they say, hey, what we're suffering as individuals and as subjectivities, they do not, these, these, our suffering does not just, is not justified by, you know, a huge boom in creative and communicative tools. And it absolutely surpasses and overcomes the utopias of Wired magazine, of, you know, the, the enthusiasts of a networked society. And, you know, if you are into this uh, communicative trend, you realize uh, how big of a downfall you might be in for. So, I mean, what is the first version of the audience commodity? And this is the audience commodity theory. And this is uh, brought to us by Dallas Smith with the blind spot debate. I don't think I should go very much into what is the blind spot debate. This is very specific, but this is a, a central reference, reference in communication studies. He's basically saying, hey, are we working, are we creating value by watching, by being spectators? And he's saying, well, yes, if you're paying attention, you're adding value to the products and companies that are, are, are advertising. Uh, also, if you are watching advertisement and watching, you know, products of the cultural industry, you are learning to become a consumer. Uh, and yes, if what you're watching is free, if you're not paying for the content, then somehow you are the thing being sold. And this is a pretty much a cliche nowadays in communications theory. Uh, you are the product, you the spectator. So yes, this might be considered work. After Dallas Smith, you know, groundbreaking work, several other authors are contesting this, his definition of work. And then we can say, well, this is not quite work because I'm not getting paid. Or if you do say that this is work, all activities could be, could be considered work. For instance, if you have a hobby or if you're writing fan fiction, and this is complicated. You can say, well, this is not producing anything. This is just reproducing capitalist ideology. This could be considered rent. You're just they're just renting your attention. They're not actually paying for this, and nothing of value is being produced. And several other factors, which we shouldn't really go into here. But you know, there are there are new recent developments and qualifications of this theory. Uh, well, finally, we have diagrams that might make things a little bit more clear. I mean, how we used to think that things worked. And I mean, most of us still think this is how things work. Basically, on the top, you have the advertising. You have the actual companies that are producing objects for consumption. And they are paying an entertainment channel to show their advertisements. The entertainment channel is attracting the audience by actually providing with shows, you know, programs, television programs, for instance, and in the in between each program, they're selling us the actual thing that they want to sell, which is the advertisements, you know, the money that came all the way from the companies producing things. And we are just, you know, taking that for fun because we want to see our shows, we have to take the advertisement as well. And then we will complete the cycle by buying things. So, you know, we're basically, the entertainment channel here is basically this intermediary channel where we are basically, uh, they are using uh, their tools, you know, in their media to help us find products and buy products. But the most important th things here are, are, you know, where money takes place is by us buying things from the advertiser. Dallas Smith, uh, he found some interesting complications in this theory. He's saying, hey, the advertisement, yes, it's paying for advertisement in money. The entertainment channel, yes, it's 
showing advertisement i mean the, the basic thing his basic functions is to show the advertisement but it's also educating people on how to be consumers and this uh, is an advance by dallas smith now the audience is actually uh, providing the entertainment channel with attention so it's not giving it for free it's providing it it's, it, it is providing it for free but you know it's something that is already turning into a commodity the attention of the audience and the entertainment channel the entertainment channel is capturing that attention and it is packaging and selling that information to the advertisement so now the entertainment channel you know he sells time for advertisement and he sells information as well and this is a these are good two commodities that appear from his model uh, this is a recapitulation of you know, the conclusions of della of della smith uh, we can only focus on the last one the entertainment channel needs to be lucrative it needs to keep its position in the market that means it's not just an intermediate, it becomes more and more of an actor, of an agent. So the entertainment channel has vested interests in this cycle. Um, for me, the most recent revolution and interesting thing happening with audience commodity theory is uh, two articles published by Michael Kaplan in 2019 because he really goes into some very uh, non-intuitive non conclusions. For instance, he's saying the channel is not selling our data. They are not selling our personal information for advertisers. They are selling the promise of our data. And this is a big trick. This is a big slide of hand that will have several consequences. And, uh, well, this that changes you know a little bit of the things we're promising to access to to this information to the advertisers uh, what are the interests of the channel i mean what do they what they really need they need more money from the advertisements of course the more money advertisements give more uh, money they have so they can precify they can give a price to the to the, the time slots they say hey i only have that specific time everyone wants that time so i'm going to charge you more for that time and they can pretend like they have more valuable data on the audience and on information of the audience this is basically the interest the the, the interests of the entertainment channel what happens i mean you kind of create a monster here because if you aggregate, if you add competition to this equation, if you say, hey, you want to advertise, uh, a, a big company, Nestlé wants to advertise on my channel. And I'm saying, well, it's not only Nestlé, but several other companies are also wanting to advertise because I promise I can give you people's attention and I can promise I can give you people's uh, information. So I can, you know, help you find your consumer. The more advertisers you have, the more uh, valuable your time slots are. So you have again an interest in, uh, in enlarging your scope of advertisers, of possible advertisers, in increasing the number of competitors for your interest. Again, this is a structural explanation. I'm saying this is not the fault of anyone involved, but this is the situation when uh, uh, that is pretty much structurally given by the way things work. Uh, what are the channel's expenses? What does he have to, you know, he has to pay for something. If so far, he's only receiving money. Well, basically has to, to pay for content producers. He has to pay for someone, for a producer, for instance, a professional producer, to produce a movie, to produce a TV show, to produce a script for a TV show, and so on. So this is basically the channel's only expense. Of course, infrastructure and communications infrastructure as well, but that really doesn't matter for us. Um, 
So what are the channel's goals? What do the channel actually need in, in order to profit more? Well, he needs to capture the audience's attention for longer, for a longer period. So it's important for him to say, my audience is watching my show uh, in its entirety and its advertisers advertisements as well. The channel has to pretend that he's capturing more information about the audience. It doesn't matter if this is true or not, but he has to give the appearance that he can give very granular and detailed information on his audience. He needs to increase the competition between the advertisers, as I've showed, and he needs to spend less in content. If he can pay very little for shows, for TV shows, for instance, uh, he profits more, and that's pretty obvious. What happens when channels are, you know, official uh, global NBC, BBC channels are substituted by platforms or social networks? I'm using here they both uh, in the same meaning, the same way. Uh, well, something very interesting happens. First of all, users become producers, the prosumer kind of user. Uh, well, everyone that is producing content, just like us, for instance, now, or anyone who has a YouTube or an Instagram account, they are becoming producers of con content. So uh, the channels or the they do not have the platforms now, the social networks or the platforms, they do not have to pay for professional made content. They can they only have to pay for the top producers, you know, those at the very, very, very top. We know that they pay millionaires, millionaire sums for those producers, but that's zero compared to professional producers. And they don't have to spend anything in training and in selecting uh, the producers. That's a big advantage for this new social actor that is the, the platforms or the social networks. The users, now that they are producers, they compete amongst themselves for attention. This is basically the situation we have now. Everyone is competing for everyone else's attention. They even pay, and you know this if you have an Instagram account, Instagram offers you, hey, if you pay uh, extra, I will increase your exposure, I will increase your visuality. So I'm not only producing content basically for free in the hopes of getting paid one day, but I'm also uh, paying the actual platform for increasing my exposure. This increases the noise you know, because everyone is competing for everyone, so there is a huge amount of noise in the system now. Uh, well, of course, every time you use a platform, you're supplying personal data, and with that, they can claim, well, if the person is spending all their day here in my social network, I have everything about that person, and I can sell that information precisely. I mean, again, it doesn't matter if they really can do this or not. We are emphasizing privacy and surveillance a lot in the recent debates. But it, it might be just a trick. I mean, who knows? Uh, and then our attention is fragmented. If you're talking about misinformation and attention, disattention, uh, basically we're living in the structural situation that is uh, <laughs> it's prone to produce more and more and more uh, cognitive dissonance and cognitive fragmentation of attention. This scheme is now complicated because now we have users taking the place of two actors that didn't used to be users. Now we have users producing, paying for advertisement for their own advertisement, for instance, here in the top, and here in the right, we have users uh, taking the place of content producers. They are producing content for cheaper, cheaper dollars. So they are, you know, actually infiltrating the system and the platform is the one that is making money from all these uh, positions. Basically, the platform is not losing any money at all, ever. This is, I mean, this is one of the great findings by Kaplan. Uh, we become advertisers, we consumers become advertisers, and the advertisers become consumers. I mean, they have to pay for the actual big companies, Nestlé has to pay uh, not only for showing their products, but for the information that the actual platform will show their uh, product to relevant people. And again, I mean, uh, this has been 
this has been in the in academia for centuries for for centuries actually uh, but everyone knows that publicity is a big sleight of hand or is a big scam it doesn't really work nobody uh, can actually predict if a campaign will work or not it the important thing is that it produces the impression that it works it's not verifiable but everyone feels like they have to pay for this we i mean expectators have been uh, you know avoiding this for longer for 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 long they have they do not watch the advertisements they skip the advertisements you know they change the tv channels when the, there's advertisement on uh so there's a you know but they still promise that they will find you the right consumer this is more complicated for the time we have, but you know, uh, take my word on this. Uh, the the Capon's you know uh, papers really go thoroughly to how big of a scam this is. But look at all the noise. I mean, we have these new actors, these platforms of these social networks that are all uh, claiming they can sell this unique product. They can sell granular or refined data on their users. They are not spending money in producing 90-90% of their content because, you know, we are producing them for free. And they are increasing the competition by including all of the consumers into the pool of producers. So Kaplan comes to these big conclusions, you know, what the attention murdered, the third point here on the first part, what the attention merchants effectively want is not attention. And this is a huge unconventional way of explaining. The, uh, we say attention economy or everyone wants attention and everyone needs to grab attention and how people are trying to grab attention. And this is uh, true. This is not uh, a lie, but structurally, the platform itself profits if it propagates distractness, distractedness, distraction, not attention. Because again, increases the noise, increases their position as saying, hey, amidst all that distraction, I'm the only uh, agent capable of selling you confidence in, in, in our data. When noise and competition increase, you know, uh, attention is more scarce, is made scarce. Presumers need to become investors. I mean, we need to pay for to have our content out there. Uh, we need to become factories. Every YouTuber out there now is trying to become a factory. He needs to standardize, he needs to scale up his produce, production, he needs to market itself, he needs any kind of, all kinds of strategies that companies have. So, I mean, we're talking about, you know, the commodification of people. We're talking about people becoming actual companies, actual enterprises. And again, uh, what kind of psychological consequences uh, does, this, does this bring? Uh, for me, the most important part of this are the impacts on subjectivity. I can uh, name here a few critics usually media critics that are dealing with these impacts on subjectivity. Uh, Stigler, for instance, uh, he talks about symbolic misery. He says, hey, there are cognitive and political losses with this whole system. We lose deep attention. We lose capacity of literacy. We lose cap By losing literacy, we lose empathy and imagination. We lose self-determination and autonomy. We lose process of individuation that had been developing for quite a, a, a long time. And this is all being lost by us being in this great pool of distraction. For uh, Bifu Berardi, we are dealing with a generation that is ravaged by depression, anxiety, and mental sickness. And it's all fruits of this insecurity of, you know, I'm being a prosumer, I'm being a producer of content, I'm fighting for your attention in a media that does not want to keep your attention for very long. It wants to increase noise and distraction. I mean, how can that really work in a long time? 
Um, and then Jonathan Beller, who really do, it's, it's, it's amazing author. I think you all should know uh, who Jonathan Beller is. And he's saying, well, this is coming not uh, recently. This is coming from a long time, again, from the end of the 19th century. And this is coming through all the media revolutions that have been taking place, especially cinema. Cinema was already playing a part of this game. So, I mean, three authors that are dealing with the impact on subjectivity. And what are the implications for research? I mean, okay, now we identified not only agents, we identified this new agent that nobody was pointing at uh, exactly. We were pointing at political agents. We were pointing at, you know, uh, traditional agents like elites. Now we we're saying there's structurally a new agent that is uh, emerging. And that new agent, you know, are platforms and social networks. Uh, however, we can say, well, how come Forster predicted this again? Can we find, you know, traces of this a hundred years ago or more than a hundred years ago? And we can. I mean, I think there is plenty of research necessary to look at those early forms of communication of fake news, as Yuri was saying, uh, you know, Julie Poor, for instance, is a historian. He, she writes for the New York Times or for the New Yorker. And she recently published a book, A History of the United States, called These Truths. And she is basically arguing since Columbus, you know, how communication and how media is affecting uh, the way politically, the way we organize politically and our subjectivities as well. So she goes into, you know, the first fake news campaigns in the beginning of the 20th century about poison ivy, you know, uh, a, a writer and a marketeer that was using sociology to to manipulate research. This is all pretty interesting. We should all look into that. We could look at new genres or other genres like reality shows and YouTube content. Uh, how formally is this economy of distraction? influencing new things, new media. Uh, this for me is the big question that aesthetics need to provide, you know, to need to, to answer in the, in the next few years. And of course, we need, we're going to need to cross uh, disciplinary borders. You know, I mean, I just have implicated psychology, sociology, media theory, uh, media research, literature, everything is uh, in here. So, I mean, it, it is absolutely necessary that we we transcend disciplinary borders. Um, and I mean, that's pretty much it. I have here just a, a general first bibliography and my references. So you can you know, pause this video later on and take a look at the references. And uh, I thank you again for this. I see you, I look forward for our conversation. Andre, thank you very much for your talk. It's you know, it brings a lot of um, complex elements, but very easy to understand because of the examples in your, uh, you, you know, your didactic explanation. So I'm sure that everybody here um, is delighted with your talk. Okay. Um, Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. And then, then um, uh, in the uh, at the end, uh, we'll have some some questions to to consider. Right. Okay, or some points to consider. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so now we are going to invite Professor Fernando Boyana. And uh, hello, Fernando. Hello. Fernando, Fernando and Lemmy will talk to us now. Yeah, no, Lemmy. Lemmy, 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 Lemmy has, has flown away. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right. So, Fernando, thanks again for accepting the invitation. And um, Fernando is going to give us a, um, you know, somehow a perspective on his doctoral thesis, I suppose. So, before Fernando starts speaking, I would like to say that he's an English teacher and a professional musician. He graduated from UNESP. Uh, San José do Rio Preto, where he also did his master's and doctorate, both in literary theory and Irish contemporary literature. Uh, his areas of interest are lit uh, Irish literature, blues, jazz, classic rock, and progressive rock. Okay, it's important to say that Fernando um, is a musician, and he now is um, is a member of three bands. 
right? Actually, four. <laughs> four. Actually, four. And two duos, right? And two yeah. duos. <laughs> <laughs> so well you can you can advertise a little bit okay um i'm, I'm going to to post here your instagram mm -hmm. as well um but fernando fernando deals with this with this branch of blues and rock music um and then we can talk a little bit more about it uh, at the end okay so the title of Fernando's Fernando's talk is Rumor as Communication Breakdown in Seamus Dean's Poetry. And Fernando, the screen is yours. Thanks again. All right. Thank you very much, Ivan, for inviting me. And thank you, thank, thank you everyone, for staying here. I hope you can uh, have the strength to stay until the bitter end. Um, Ivan has this great talent of uh, now and again bringing me back from self-imposed academic early retirement and uh, that's the second time he does it so uh, it means he is very persuasive somehow and uh, i would also like to point out that i'm going to totally ruin the atmosphere of philosophical discussion about lots of uh, interesting philosophical books about fake news and I'll ruin all this lovely intellectual atmosphere with a little bit of poetry. And uh, I hope you don't mind, all right? So uh, as I promised to do, <clears throat> that's what I'm going to talk about today. This, the talk is called Rumorous Communication Breakdown in Seamus Dean's Poetry and Communication Breakdown. You can obviously hear his echoes of Led Zeppelin in the title. And, uh, well, who is this guy called Seamus Dean? Uh, poet, novelist, and literary critic Seamus Dean discussed the idea of fake news long before it was cool, as the young people say. However, he didn't use the infamous phrase we quite often invoke these days to describe nine out of 10 messages infesting our instant communication apps of choice every single minute. Right now, as I am speaking, I knew I have probably four or five new, totally unimportant messages on my WhatsApp, for instance. Uh, well, um, Seamus Dean, he didn't call it fake news. Uh, and the fact that he didn't call it fake news is of no relevance since he elegantly walked us through a hazy territory that current political pundits often fear to tread. All right. In his books, especially the poetry books, Dean wrote four books of poems and uh, a novel and countless others, um, countless others, uh, countless other, sorry, other critical books, okay? In his books of poetry, Dean gave poetic form to the idea of deliberate confusion as political strategy. He did that by exploring the notion of rumor, you already talked about rumor in the beginning, as both motif and theme. This is indeed the blueprint that Dean uses to engender poetic images uh, that encapsulate the tension between rumor and truth. Also, Dean works out these notions so as to create a scenario of individual and social bewilderment that, time and again, can prove lethal. In a way, his verse is drenched with the idea that careless talk costs lives, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if you're familiar or not with this topic, but, but with this phrase, but this is this is the phrase, careless talk costs lives. It was a massive British campaign in the Second World War to avoid, uh, um, you know, to avoid, to encourage people to avoid volunteering information to the Nazi people. It, it was a, seri a series of very elegant cartoons uh, made by Cyril Kenneth Bird, Bird um, also known as Fugas. And uh, uh, that's the... Uh, that's the series of cartoons. And by the way, this is Seamus Dean, in case you don't know the guy. I'll leave his picture here so that you can admire his handsomeness. As I wrote a few years ago uh, for my doctorate, 
Rumors. Rumors is this book here. It is the second book of poems ever published by Seamus Dean. Okay, published in 1977. Okay. Rumors, this book that I've just shown you, is permeated by the angst in the face of extreme situations I wrote at that time. Uh, this, for obvious reasons, sets alarm bells ringing for us, or doesn't it? Well, in that text, I went on to argue that, again, quote, in rumors, Dean explores the uncertainties, tensions, and embedded paradoxes that this discursive notion implies. Uh, end of the quote. I shall talk about it in a minute. And then I continued in my, uh, my doctorate thesis or dissertation, really. I continued, the poems in this collection address matters of truth, perspective, discourse, and the issues that arise when the individual is aware that he or she only apprehends the world through language. End of the quote. And as this is a literature congress or event, we all know well that language is the quintessential bearer of rumor in that it can clear up ideas and create confusion. And here to paraphrase philosophers Robert Fripp and Greg Lake, confusion will be our epitaph as we crawl a cracked and broken path. Well, indeed, the word rumor itself is quite telling of how Dean speakers and ourselves perceive the world and try to make sense of it. So, uh, uh, actually, a uh, book of poems pub published in the 1970s, late 70s, has more to do with our reality than you can uh, actually think of um, uh, uh, actually think of when you look at it for the first time. Well, make, making sense of the world I was talking about. This is an inglorious task in that to a great extent we are surrounded by rumors, aren't we? You don't have to read Dean's poems to see it. Just look around, you know, choose your favorite semi-authoritarian government in any kind of Latin American country. We constantly deal with information of uncertain origin, we've seen this before, and also with unverified information we hear through the grapevine. Most importantly, it is the oftentimes deliberate mixing of truth and lies at the heart of the notion of rumor, because this is the key thing about rumors, that matters so much for Dean's work. Not surprisingly, this is of paramount importance for us to understand our current reality, if that is really possible, I must add. In short, there is nothing as contemporary as rumor, okay? Rumors, the poem, or the book Rumors, for instance, opens with uh, an acknowledgement of ignorance and doubtfulness. And uh, the poem in the, in the book, there is a poem call, called Rumors too, and the poem opens with an acknowledgement of ignorance and doubtfulness, as the speaker in the poem claims. Quote, I wish I knew what they were saying. I'm never sure what it is I hear, end of the quote. The lines, um, if you like a little bit of philosophy, the lines clearly revisit the Socratic idea, I know that I know nothing, by reinscribing it in a way that merges the past and the present, as it implies that the speaker's uncertainty still haunts him. It's not only that I don't know, I can't know, and that's terrible for me. And on, the, and, and on the speaker goes, I wish I knew that other language with the ear of infallible reception, which I bring to the English of failure. End of the quote. Um, as, I, uh, as I wrote in a previous study, the same one I've mentioned before, this excerpt is structured upon, upon a flagrant paradox, the infallible reception and the English of failure. The gap between attentive perception and faulty communicativeness creates this irreconcilable contrast that bespeaks, at the same time, misunderstanding and unlikely resolution. This is the whole, uh, uh, this is the whole atmosphere of the poem and the book, in a way. The speaker's musings 
appear more clearly in the second stanza of this poem, however. In it, the memory of, quote, people and the police brawling on a deserted square, um, uh, also, uh, I'm sorry, uh, in it, there is the memory of people and police brawling in a, on a deserted square, okay, which is, of course, a memory of violence and confusion, riots, okay? Um, and I went on to uh, write in my, in my work. So uh, I must warn you, this is a long quote now. Quote, the scene of this quarrel between the individual and the state forces, okay, and the flagrant imbalance of power and the speaker's recolle recollection of his interlocutor overlooking this fight all draw potent parallel between barbarity and omission. And you know that um, uh, barbarity loves omissions, okay? This in turn works as a snapshot of the political tensions in which the poem is suffused, which gradually takes shape as the speaker proceeds, proceeds with his account, okay? The poetic effect thus created is that of a growing awareness of the roots of these dissensions, which are encapsulated by the poem, but only elusively addressed by it. That's the beauty of Dean's poetry. Um, uh, that's be the beauty of poetry, really. So you talk about the most um, uh, uh, vicious kinds of things, and at the same time, you, you simply do it in very elegant and beautiful ways. And then I quote the poem. I can hear now what politics is saying to someone who can hear. All right. These rumors start. Okay. Oh, I'll read again to get the better meter. I can hear now what politics is saying to someone who can hear these rumors start. Much better. Okay. Claims the speaker in the third stanza just before quoting a passage which deals with death in a very indirect way while he emphasizes the imbrication of falsehood and veracity contained in the semantics of the poem's title. Um, well, I, I think I don't have to explain. We all have lived in the contemporary uh, Brazil. We, all, we have all lived in contemporary Brazil. We know exactly that false information can lead to, to, to mass killing, as we have seen with the COVID pandemic, right? And then I move on. What emerges from this tension is, in the final analysis, a ceaseless battle over which versions of historical and political narratives that permeate the Northern Irish experience should prevail in the end. Because that's the context that she, that, that Seamus Dean uh, brings into uh, his poetry. Okay, it bring it, it's actually uh, creating a dialogue between the uh, the troubles in Northern Ireland and his verse. Okay. Memory meets politics in an, unmist in an unmistakable f fashion here, okay? And I would say, also say, in a, in a lethal fashion, in a dangerous fashion, okay? In rumors, um, we can say, in, in the whole book, rumors, I won't have time to, to go through the entire uh, catalog of Dean's poems, but I, I recommend that you, that you read them okay at some point go online and, and read the, the poems you can find them okay so in this book rumors poetic subjectivity and it's particularly individual reading of the world emerges as part of an equation of which the other half is a series of pressing historical political and for that matter ideological questions thus Lyricism and politics, invention and truth, memory and history are intertwined in the language of rumors, in the, in the book a whole, as a whole. The poems in this collection address matters of truth, perspective, discourse, and the issues that arise when the individual is aware that he or she only apprehends the world through language. And that's the problem. The title poem, for instance, deals with failure of communication. So I would, uh, the, the, the passage that I mentioned, um, I wish I knew that other language with the ear of infallible reception, which I bring to the English of failure. Okay, just to repeat the, the thing I've, I've mentioned before. 
Dean wrote and published his poems in a turbulent historical context of ideological rifts that culminated in political violence of all sorts, which is 1970s Northern Ireland, right? And that, as we saw in the example I showed, is recreated in his poetry. As I also argued in a previous study, the same one, um, as we work out the complexities of the individual poetic consciousness in a poem like Rumors or in the poems of this book, in this book, for instance, we also trace the nature of the historical forces acting upon the speaker's attempts at reading his world. In this particular example, we as readers are involved in an atmosphere of uncertainty, not only about the speaker's unknowingness, but also about the actual contextual forces creating and feeding his angst. This feeling is reinforced by clash between resistance and resignation that the poem ultimately embodies. Okay. This is shaped by poetic language, which is fraught with the uneasiness of doubt, the ardent desire for the truth to appear, and the speaker's painful realization that his wish cannot be fulfilled as he wants. End of the quote. Can we make sense of reality without re resorting to language? No, we can't. Can we trust language? mainly in the context of opposing ideological groups constantly at daggers drawn? No, we can't. This is partially why Dean Speaker is fraught with all this anxiety. All right. But what can poems written decades ago about individuals and situations apparently unrelated to ourselves actually tell us 20th century readers well as i said in the beginning dean mainly in the book rumors managed to lay bare how misinformation and disinformation are produced he didn't expect uh, he didn't explain them conceptually he said there you go this is how it works look behold um he also showed how they can quite often lead to death and misery and how they can be used for rather questionable political purposes, to say the least. In short, even though Dean's poetry can't offer solutions to these problems we face now, let's be honest, poets are not supposed to do the work that politicians should do. Poets are not, poets are not there to offer solutions. It can at least make you a much better reader of our contemporary reality than you might have ever thought. In other words, read Dean to better understand our reality. If that won't persuade you to read his poems, well, then nothing else will. That's it, people. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Fernando. Thank you very much for your talk and, and bringing us a little bit of what uh, Seamus Dean was was capable to do, right? Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, now I'd like to, to, to see if there are any comments from, from the audience. Any, Fred, can you help me with this? Any questions, any comments? Uh, let's see. Um, okay, amazing presentations. I'll put the question that we had from the, from the comments in the uh, chat. Um, if it's all right, we can get all of the presenters here up screen, on screen. Yes. That yes, okay. let's do that. Let's see here. We're gonna have right. a few minutes for, for some for some questions. There's still time. Okay. Those who make questions will participate of a raffle. <laughs> I'm joking. Have you seen the scenario of my house? It's fake. Oh. 
Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're really into the presentation into the topic right <laughs> okay okay so, so we have one question from the chat uh which i'll bring up here mm -hmm. um, can we say that spreading fake news is an instrument of power okay i guess it's a general question so you feel free to so I, I would say that uh, if it's not an instrument of power, it's a way of maybe achieving the power. Because when you spread fake news, thinking about power, you may do uh, anything, you know? So uh, we have no limits for fake news if uh, the person, those, like I said, invisible forces, most of the times not invisible, uh, if they are interested in power, no. So maybe power is a, a very frequent, maybe uh, Andrea and Fernando may help me, uh, frequent motivation for people, you know, to spread and maybe to create fake news. Uh, and if I talk about literature, um, most novels, especially if, if you talk about novels, you know, fiction books, uh, most of the time, many of them, uh, the instrument, the, the reason is people searching uh, of power, people in search of power. Well, uh, if I may add, I mean, I, I would answer unequivocally, yes, <laughs> uh, it is, it, it can be an instrument of power. Uh, however, I mean, I still think we can change the conversation uh, or change the question because i mean it's obvious you know that donald trump or uh, that vladimir putin you know exercise their power by uh using fake news by spreading fake news and disinformation you know you, you have a clear agent with their interests in spreading fake news however i mean I, i'm much more curious about those fake news that apparently do not serve any obvious interest. I mean, people just, I mean, have you, have you seen those videos of instructions of, you know, tool hacks, people give life hacks and they tell you, Hey, you can, you can, you know, fix your door, fix your apartment by using uh, this material, by using guns, you know, and they give absolutely dangerous hacks for life. Yeah. But and nobody actually does this, you know, nobody actually uh, actually goes through the steps of seeing this, but people watch the video. So, you know, they are pretending that they're giving life instructions, but they all, they, all that they want is views, is engagement, and they want even negative engagement. They want people to uh, comment on it negatively. So, I mean, what is this monster that is being produced? that is not serving uh, a, a political interest per se right now. Uh, we cannot actually establish the power, who has the power. We have basically people competing for people's attention and doing whatever they can to do this. And this is like, this leads to a whole new genre. This is a new genre. I had never seen this genre before. You know, instructions for life that absolutely do not work. And there is a literary genre that is new, pretty new. Uh, so, I mean, these are the, the kinds of questions that, you know, it, it will lead us to acknowledging that power is a more complicated thing than people in power. It will lead us to understand that there is a, a structural power uh, in place there that is, you know, shaping our behaviors and, uh, well, everything we do online and offline. And what do you think, Fernando? <laughs> well, uh, 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 what kind of power does the person who asked the question, I don't know how to pronounce the name, is that, that's, I don't know, correct me if the pronunciation is wrong. Tata, tata, I think. No, tata, tata, x, <laughs> whatever. Okay. And uh, what do you mean by power? What kind of power do you have in mind? Because uh, in a way, we all cherish the idea of telling somebody else what to do, all right? Everybody here has a mother or a mother-in-law or a father-in-law or whatever who's always telling you, okay, uh, have your hair cut and then you should uh, lose a few pounds, this kind of thing. So this is, this is a kind of way of uh, 
telling people they have some power over you. So power is a very generic thing, and it can be political power or can be the power of over uh, my cockatiel who was here a, a couple of minutes ago and I said, go, I've got power over it. I like to think it uh, this way. And, and then, so yes, if, uh, uh, and one ways of uh, uh, controlling people is lying to people, of course. That's why, that's why, um, that's why politicians lie. <laughs> All right. I don't lie. I personally, I, 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 I completely understand the, the, the necessity to have a concept like fake news and develop this concept into kind of a book or articles, whatever. But personally speaking, I don't like the, the word fake news. I prefer calling it lies, you know, because uh, uh, that's what it is in the end. Even in, even though, uh, even if they are kind of inoffensive, <laughs> uh, well, uh, the, the hacks that Andre mentioned are not necessarily inoffensive because, you know, a stupid person can easily kill himself or herself doing that, all right? But what can we do? Stupid people kill themselves, we know that. So uh, uh, then uh, uh, it's a lie anyhow, anyhow, and then if, if, if you are a politician and you spread the wrong message, well, if let's, let's get a real example, real life example, don't get vaccinated because it can kill you. Really? All right, then. So uh, this can kill. Uh, care, this is a kind of careless, uh, careless talk or not so careless talk that costs lives. In Brazil, it has cost 600,000 lives approximately. That, that's quite a lot, you know, that, that could be it. That could be a uh, uh, that could be the size of a city like Rio Preto, where I live. So, you know, vanished into thin air, right? So, yes, I think uh, I think it is certainly an instrument of power, but not but not only political power, any kind of power. Okay, uh, it can be the power over a country, but it can be the power over your pet, for example. But it still is a kind of power. All right. So yes, the answer yes. Okay, okay, yeah. Um, you know, just before we we get uh, more questions, um, so your talks raised a lot of thoughts here, even though the thoughts are going to be uh, kind of fragmented. But it's nice to think as I was uh, as I was uh, listening to Yuri talk, um, I remember this 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 idea, this concept that one piece of good news is told to just one person, right? We spread it just to one person. And a piece of bad news is told to at least five people. So this is this is somehow um, you know a very a very harsh harsh math uh, that perhaps has given um, given much more birth to the spread of fake news because somehow fake news is something that it's that is not only provocative but but people people somehow are led to 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 spread those those types of news right and and they don't they don't fact check it at all which is which is of course a, a problem right so sometimes the attitude of fake news propagators uh, they tend to be connected to their own personality, <laughs> and then then uh, we we can we can uh, regard some personalities, and I'm not talking about only uh, political personalities, but but those who spread fake news because it's it, it belongs to their character, be it an an instrument of power, be it an instrument of recognition, right? They 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 do that. And most of them know that they are spreading fake news. But for, uh, for, for their interpretive community, uh, they build a huge success. Okay? Uh, so whatever they say will cause price rising, panic, denial of some sort. Right? Fernando has just mentioned uh -huh. uh, vaccination, uh, culture stereotyping. Okay? So don't go to that country because people do this, okay? Which is, um, which is product of fake news. Uh, 
when when Andrea was talking, I, I, I you know, uh, your talk reminded me of the social di the dilemma that documentary uh, that was on Netflix a couple of months ago, and uh, and 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 how people are manipulated with the data, or how we are manipulated uh, with the data we ourselves produce. Right, and then I, uh, it reminded me of Jean Baudrillard, and uh, Jean Baudrillard says that the technological system developed in the amount of information play part in the definition of critical mass, because the machine represents the individual who becomes a virtual element of such system. Okay, um, perhaps Charlie Chaplin had done this. Okay, uh, you know, many decades ago. Uh, showing how this modern machine would uh, swallow us in the near future, and the near future is now. Okay, so we are in this present when uh, the media is swallowing us. Okay, so fr from this, I was thinking about um, one question. Okay, just have some comments before we move on, or before I pass it to you. Uh, but what is the role of the media in general and the social media in spreading or preventing fake news? We can see that fact-checking, as I was saying before, is essential to such prevention, but they still are subject to fake news and rumors. Where should I go to fact-check such news, right? And, 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 and the funny thing is most of fake news, they are really short. So they, they don't give room for, for discussion, right? They just bring, it, it's, it's, like a, it's like a newspaper headline, but with no, with no text <laughs> below it, right? Another thing that caught my attention is this, uh, you mentioned, right? If you don't get paid, you can't call it work. Um, uh, I think it was Smith's idea, right? Uh, nowadays, we are facing this in Brazil, but the idea is somehow subverted because um, research says that uh, the, the employment rate in Brazil is raising, but the salaries are going down. And, and for this government, for example, one of, one of the... One of, one of the, uh, one of the dec discourses that they have is to distort the reality by saying, uh, "Well, you are being paid less, but but you know, thanks God you're working, <laughs> right?" So this is this is a distortion of this reality. Work with your carteira de trabalho, um, you know, officially signed, but you are going to pay. You're going to be paid half of what you should get paid. Okay, so. This is something that we should also uh, discuss. To what extent this is not slavery, for example, okay? Uh, or to whom this, um, this rate uh, favors? We know who, okay? Politicians, um, for example, um, companies, for example, but not to the, the, not to the employees, right? And uh, just two more things I would like to point out. Um, the conventional model is similar to the views in social media nowadays, right? Because what 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 um, uh, what propels the the, the commercial um, the, the, the advertising companies is the amount of views that you receive in a in a post you you, you have or in a video you upload. Right. Uh, let's remember that this follows the same strategy of the old magazines. Right. In the times of magazines, um, they 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 made a study that related uh, that 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 tried to catch the attention of the reader in half a second. For example, this was the time uh, you know that you that you turn the page of a magazine. So in the case of, for example, the advertising on YouTube video is five seconds, okay? If they don't catch your attention in five seconds, you just um, uh, skip the, the ad, okay? So the, the idea is pretty much the same, to catch the attention in a few seconds. Uh, 
And then you get to the idea of creating a monster, <laughs> right? That was repeated uh, by you, Andrea. Uh, and, and then we have here a, a funny, funny, a funny episode that happened a couple of months ago with McDonald's because McDonald's made a huge amount of money advertising um, advertising a sandwich called Mac Picanha. Do you remember that? And Mac Picanha was then, it was found out then that Mac Picanha didn't use Picanha at all. But when, 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 it, when they found out about it, a lot of, uh, you know, I don't know, millions and millions of sandwiches had already been sold with the name She's Picanha, Mac Picanha, I don't remember the name. And then what did Burger King do? You know what? Our, our BK Costella, our Costella sandwich, our rib sandwich, doesn't take Costella at all. Right? So <laughs> if McDonald's can admit that they don't use the meat they are advertising, we are, we are going to the same, uh, to the same uh, direction and say that we also don't use that product. But again, Burger King also sold a lot of um, um, sandwiches advertising something that was fake. Okay, so this is very interesting. So all, all the discussions you brought uh, provoked these thoughts, and it's very interesting that that um, your talks are connected to real to the reality we are living right now. Which is which is amazing, yeah. So I would like to to point this out. If you would like to comment on that, okay. Uh, I think Yuri, right? Uh, the first question was addressed to Yuri. I was thinking about, for example, uh, something that I've read in some place. I don't know the source, but it's not fake news uh, or lies, as Venom said. Um, related to those those agencies, Ivan, that you've mentioned, the ones responsible for the you know clarification of fake news, you know, uh, proving or you know uh, when you type, for example, something that you don't know if it's true or not, and those agencies they check the information. I've read in some place that, for example, fake news while spread in some place, for example, in a, in a, a website, uh, they have more um, entries. I think it's the right name we use in the internet. I think, of, uh, how can I say, um, people um, access more the fake news themselves. But when, for example, the person who had the problem, for example, involved with the fake news, tries to prove and wants a space uh, to, you know, to to say what really happened, this is this has not the same. Um, how can I say the proportion of people is much less, you know. So people are not interested uh, in the truth. In this case, you know, when the person tries to prove, the person asks for a space, the press gives those space, that the space for that person, uh, but the number of, uh, of access to that uh, note, for example, of information is not the same. So um, it's something very dangerous, for, a, for example, for a person involved. I'm always saying that, you know, sometimes it's a company, Sometimes it's a product, as Andrea said, and Ivan, for example. I was thinking about many situations in which I was watching something on TV and the person was, I don't know, selling that. And I was watching and knowing that that was not the truth, you know. Uh, some Two days ago, I was watching something on TV and the person was saying something. It was a recipe, <laughs> And the person was giving some clues. And because I cook, I was thinking that it does not work at all, you know. So uh, we have two situations related to lies. 
uh, spreading on the internet, on websites, or maybe personally, like I said, word of mouth. For example, uh, like uh, as I have written here, uh, word of mouth negative marketing may close a restaurant, for example, and people don't even try the restaurant. They heard about, they don't check if it's the information it's true or not. They don't, if they, if they have never been there, they are not going there. But if they have been there before, they are not coming back anymore, you know. Uh, and maybe the restaurant closed suddenly and nobody knows what really happened. We have lists of situations, you know. So that's why uh, humors may be very dangerous. Gossips, um, those, uh, how, how can I say, those uh, um, reports, you know, fake reports about situations may be very dangerous. And I see no space for, you know, clarifying the information, checking the information. I know that we have specialized agencies to check those informations. But I don't see, you know, it's, uh, it's common sense, it's not scientific, but I don't see uh, the interest in, you know, in clarifying, in checking the information in the same proportion. I don't know, I'm not sure if, I'm, if I was clear during my talk. André and Fernando. Yeah, I think you, you nailed it. Like when you said they don't have any, there is no interest, there is no structural uh, pressure to increase critical uh, literacy, for instance. Uh, I mean, this is, I mean, the core of the debate on the regulation. We spend so much time talking about regulation and who can fact check or who cannot fact check. And we go over in circles and circles and circles as if it were possible to do this in any scalable way. Uh, I mean, again, if we are living in this culture of distraction, of generalized distraction on all the pressures the important players are putting on the consumers are to increase their discretion, their fragmentation of their attention, they are losing critical literacy capability. I mean, we do not learn how to communicate uh, in how to understand, how to read, how to evaluate news or, or any kind of textual material, be it uh, actual reading material or video script written for video. We, we lose that absolutely, that capacity, you know, to communicate and to evaluate and to rationalize on things. Which, I mean, for me, this is, uh, kind of relates to Fernando's, you know, into poetry. Because poetry absolutely doesn't care, right? I mean, a big generalization here, but it doesn't care about factual truths. It doesn't care about being correct about nuances and specifics of the world, right? I mean, it cares for something. Uh, it can even completely say, I'm a rumor, I'm a lie, I'm going to lie about everything. However, it does engage you. It has to engage you into a relationship of uh, reading, into a relationship of an interchange of, let's say, energies between reader and authors and a reader community. You have to make effort, you have to work towards interpreting, towards agreeing or disagreeing, towards solving or living with ambiguities. And that's so interesting about poetry and fake news, right? Because fake news, they want to disseminate ambiguity, but they deny that they are ambiguous. They say, I'm telling you the absolute truth. Poetry does the exact opposite. <laughs> It's saying, hey, I am ambiguous, my core is ambiguous, but if you move through that ambiguity, you might get to certain uh, overall consensus and truths. And this is a very democratic kind of approach. At least when I teach poetry, I try to emphasize this democratic approach to, to literature. It's the reading community. It's the Emily Dickinson's, you know, the circuit that is involving everyone in the reading process. If we lose that circuit, if you lose that exchange of information that has to deal with ambiguity head on, uh, we lose our, our everything that we know about communication and literacy and, and subjectivity that ensues. And this is, I think, I mean, a much more interesting argument and uh, problem for us to solve, especially us here in our areas. And I'm, I'm, I'm you know, <laughs> uh, actually giving us our proper value, because it's basically what we have to do in the classrooms, right? 
I mean, to develop, I mean, ideally, this kind of critical literacy capability and means of interpreting the world and many, many worlds, you know, from the past and from the future and from different worlds. Uh, if we lose that, I think we're pretty bad. Uh, the second question that Ivan asked me was about, you know, the models of audience commodity theory. And I absolutely agree, they are not new. I mean, magazines and radio and any kind of organized advertisement. And even, let's say, in, in the first printing presses, people were publishing their own opinions and, you know, they were on the streets distributing pamphlets. This was the, in the 1800s, in the 1830s, this was the, the YouTube of the day. You had your own friend who had a printing press and you printed your pamphlets and you went out into the streets and distributed it. And, you know, the information was biased, the information was there, but you had this general democratic exchange and, and so on. And then when magazine is the advertisement, when advertisement enters the, the, the equation, of course, it, it, it already creates the structure where you are kind of creating a monster. The monster is already there. It's a small dinosaur, not a big dinosaur yet. However, when you put so much power in the hands of a monopoly, a technological monopoly, the scale is absolutely different. And, you know, in changes, in, it's a quantitative change that turns into a qualitative change. It turns into something else already because they are both a lot more scalar. They are huge companies, monopoly companies, and they are more granular. Their information is not derived from economists and social scientists. They were trying to derive models to understand who the consumer is. They are actually coming from the, you know, from us, from the consumers themselves, and from all the data that we generate. So this is uh, this is pretty interesting. I think, and again, the public debate, especially around the movie that you mentioned, the documentary that you mentioned, uh, it goes still in a very, I don't know, uh, idealistic and personal approach because it, you know, it only makes us care about the privacy of our information, about the property of our information. All of these debates, they deal with privacy and property. Many, many, many authors, they are still emphasizing privacy and property, like these bourgeois liberal values from the 1920s, you know, and they make us feel, oh, my privacy is being invaded. My, my, yeah, everyone already knew who you were by using mathematical methods and establishing who was going to win for politics. This is a very, this is absolutely not, a, not anything new. However, it does affect us. Uh, but I mean, is this really how you want to go? Or you want to go about, again, these structural pressures that uh, makes us uh, victims, targets for this? As Yuri very well said, uh, there is absolutely no structural pressure for change. So, I mean, this will simply keep growing and growing and growing and growing until probably the bubble bursts until that we find out i mean look how ridiculous is advertisement on google you 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 try to find a tv you search for a tv and then everything that they, they show you are tvs you buy a tv they still keep showing you the tv so you know this is a sleight of hand this is a trick they're basically already having uh, people you know they know what people want because the people have told them what they want and then they show you what they want and then i go there and i buy a tv because i'm looking for a tv and then they say how see i was so successful i showed this person that tv and he bought it he did not create the demand for a tv he actually just gave me what i wanted and he's just saying to the, all the advertisers that you know that they created this this desire in you and they made you buy the TV. And this is bullshit. This is a bubble that will soon burst as soon as commodity prices you know uh, uh, fall, as soon as the rate of profits fall, as soon as you know big um, big uh, companies that are actually producing things you know they start spending less money in this, it will all crumble down. Uh, and again, for the last question was the McDonald's debate, you know, the not meat, meat, not meat. And this is kind of interesting debate because it's rare, you know, for people to care so much about the truth, about what they want. Because nobody goes to McDonald's because, here in Brazil, I mean, in the US, they go to McDonald's because it's affordable. Here in Brazil, they go to McDonald's because it is a status symbol. 
So, I mean, nobody cares about what's in the sandwiches and how they taste and how they are. They care for the status of going to McDonald's, a foreign restaurant. And this is weird for Americans when they come to Brazil. They say, why are people, you know, there are shopping malls filled with people queuing for the McDonald's? Because it's a status symbol. It's, uh, again, I'm, I'm being the most basic bourgeoisian that you can ever find here uh, in Baudrillard and Baud in Bourdieu, you know, all this symbolic approaches to consumerism. They're saying we're basically consuming in order to exchange signs, symbolic signs that we can consume and that, that we belong to a certain elite and that we have a certain status. That's why it's funny, kind of, the, the Picanha debate, because, again, it brought something that hadn't been discussed for a long time, you know, what is McDonald's really made of? Uh, and nobody really cares for this, but we pretend like we care and we debunk this uh, and then becomes a funny thing. But it's, again, engagement for McDonald's themselves. And there are people uh, already saying, I don't care what I see in McDonald's. I only I, I like McDonald's, so I go there. I don't care if there are no chicken in the chicken nuggets. You know, it's it's what I can afford. It's nice. It's fancy for me, so I will buy it. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes I, I don't agree very much with those strict sociologic approaches to consumerism and to culture, like Bourdieu and Baudrillard. I think they, are, they have problems, but they do explain these behaviors uh, pretty well. <laughs> yeah, well done. Very well said. Um, and then we have one last question, just to, to wrap it up, right, Fred? Yes, we do. Sure, it here. It's mm -hmm. from Professor Chris, um, directed towards uh, Professor Andre, but I imagine we'll all have something to say about it. So, could you comment a little bit more on the impacts of subjectivity? and how neoliberalism relates to the idea of disattention economy. Yeah, I mean, uh, this was the subject of my, of my uh, doctorate dissertation. I basically studied television and neoliberalism. And I, I, my, my point was the newer TV shows, the evolution of TV shows since the 80s, they are entangled with the entrepreneurial self, with you know, a mixing of work and leisure, and with the person being this entrepreneur of themselves, and that's absolutely uh, the, the the one of the tenets. Oh right, she mentions even entrepreneur herself. Uh, this is one of the tenets of neoliberalism. I mean, when you absolutely, um, you know, in the eighties in Thatcher's uh, and Reagan's uh, governments, when you dissolve the social bonds and the social security nets that people were used to and you make them basically struggle for their lives uh, they have to become this is the same thing that is happening now in a much greater scale they have to become companies and they have to become industries of themselves the different thing is you know in the 80s and 90s that meant hard working and, and networking and working in the services industry and you know promoting this image of yourself this was already beginning in the 80s with the neoliberal ideology. Uh, now, what we are actually seeing is this, I mean, on a whole different scale, because everything is image. Everything is how you produce and you dress up and you make your own spectacle. So, I mean, if you want uh, a progression, if you want, uh, you know, uh, neoliberal on steroids, uh, there you have it. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I guess with this this answer, we wrap up the session of the afternoon for ECD Day. I would like again to talk, uh, to talk, sorry, uh, to thank everybody who was here, um, present with us, the audience, and the guests who are also here um, for accepting the invitation and talking to us brilliant topics brilliant subjects really up-to-date subjects and i thank again professor yuri andre and fernando uh, i would like to thank fred and dylan for the the tech support okay and let's just remind you that at seven o'clock we're going to have a pocket show with professor mark donnelly right. uh, he's a fulbright um professor who is who is here at ufu and he kindly accepted to to give us this 
this, this pocket show at 7 o'clock. And then you're going to have a roundtable session with Professor Claudia Negro and uh, Professor Cielo Festino. Okay, so I hope to see you all there. I'm just going to paste the link here, just in case. Oh, yeah, uh, Fred has done this already. And um, I hope to see you in the evening. Thank you so much. Uh, be safe, be cool, and see you then. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. The audience. <laughs>